How do you find the will to fight back against a world that wants to keep you sedated, average, and stuck in place? Join us for the tools and strategies you need to create a life of abundance, discipline, and high achievement. This, this, is, this is the Tactical Empire with Jeff Smith. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of The Tactical Empire. I'm excited about our guest today, Mr. Jason Labrash, a friend of mine, for a owner of Grizzly Iron out of Phoenix, Arizona. They do metal fabrication and blacksmithing, and I am definitely looking forward to digging into that a little bit with him because he's got a really unique business, and I, I want to dig into that a little bit then we'll talk entrepreneurship and whatever topics uh kind of come up as we get into it thanks for coming jason well thanks for having me absolutely man absolutely i uh we were talking offline a little bit about the the different directions we could take this and uh, i'm definitely looking forward to it i've never had a blacksmither a metal fabricator on. So tell me how you got into that industry. So uh, it's a family owned business. Uh, I've uh, grown up in the business, so to say. Um, I'll be honest, I've never actually had a real job outside of this business. (laughs) You know, so um, grew up even in school, working summers, working in the shop or, you know, and, and learning things here and there, learning how to weld when I was 12 years old, 11 years old. And, and then, uh, you know, as the company grew, we also got more in depth into blacksmithing. You know, we started out as just a metal fabrication shop, um, doing mostly ornamental ironwork. And, um, as jobs got more complicated for requests got more complicated, the, we had to up our skill level. And I would say, as in we, my dad at the, at the time was the primary uh, person working on the projects. And so just as went along, he uh, learned how to do more blacksmithing, more forged work and, and learn more skills. Um, and uh, yeah. Awesome. What is the, what is blacksmithing for the audience out there? When I think about that, what am I, what am I looking at? So blacksmithing is when we take a piece of metal and uh, we we transform it into a different shape. Okay. Um, so we're taking a square bar, a round bar, a flat bar, and we are taking and changing the shape of that metal. We're heating it up to uh, about 1800 to 2000 degrees and we are hitting it or pressing it or somehow smashing it some way and reshaping it. Um, so, so the, like the movies, like forged iron, that's oh yeah, orange yeah. hot and you're beating it. Yep. Like yep. Tony Stark and Iron Man. Yes. Yeah. He's doing it all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that's but, hilarious. Cause we, but it's, we watch all kinds of military movies and I'm like, that's not how that fucking happens. That's, <laughs> that's it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually. And then, uh, then the other Iron Man with uh, the other actor, he's doing it better than Tony Stark. I forget. Um, what's his name? Uh, uh, Mickey Rourke is he's forging better than, <laughs> than Tony was. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh, so, yeah, you, you know, we, we, uh, we'll custom, you know, a lot of people see scroll work, you know, the, the S shapes and C shapes and stuff in gates. That's the most common types of, uh, blacksmithing. Um, and a lot of times that's actually not forged by people. Like there's some machines that can make those things, but we actually, we do forge them. Um, and it's usually the details that are put into it and, um, it just really makes it handmade. Okay. Um, we're also forging other elements, um, like, uh, balusters or pickets for railings where we're doing a custom detail, a knuckle, um, that is a completely different shape than the bar stock. Um, you know, we'll, we'll take a large bar and forge it down to where we have a small, uh, little ball detail, but there's tapers and the pickets are small on either end. And it, it just creates a much, you know, a handmade look. Yeah. Um, and so it's it, really and art. It is, it, yeah. it is, it's a real art and a craft. And it, I mean, it's one of the oldest crafts, um, I mean, it, it was a trade that supported almost every other trade. 
Um, I won't go into too long a detail, but there is a story that about the um, the king and and the um, and he bringing all the trades in, and he discovered that the blacksmith was the 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 man in the town who actually made all the tools for every other trade. And when he asked him, well, where'd you get your tools? Well, the blacksmith said, I made them myself. So the king promoted him as the master of all trades. Um, so, you know, and so, I mean, it, like I said, it's one of the oldest crafts um, and what supported a lot of civilization for a long time. So, right. Right. That's amazing. That is awesome. I mean, I'm trying to think of where we could take the conversation, but it can go in a million directions because you've got sure. you, you brought up two really cool things that I like talking about, which are the the importance of trades currently, mm -hmm. um, and how that is kind of going by the wayside and being lost. Like, do you guys have an issue with pipelining talent? I guess in this field, are you seeing the same thing that plumbers and electricians and diesel mechanics are say, seeing? Oh, it's there. Is, there is some challenges, and uh, I would say I would I would answer that question differently a couple of years ago or even a year ago. Um, I would you know I would say that we were actually struggling more to find people, okay. um, and part of that was because of our approach to it. Um, so, and I mean, like most, most trades are struggling to find skilled labor and it's still, I mean, it's, it's still definitely, uh, difficult to find. Um, but we've, we've, uh, learning through our network in apex, I've actually learned a lot about how to, you know, hiring and I've got a better pipeline, <laughs> you know, of that hiring process. So. so do you think that comes about because of your social media or what, what, what do you think changed when you say, I would say that things were different a year ago? Um, it is using the right, the right tools to do it. And social media helps a little bit. Um, we definitely have a little bit of, a little bit of people coming to us because of that, um, you know, or, or it's, friends of a friend somehow refer, you know, is sending someone our way that, and that only happens on occasion. I would, I would, there's not too many of our team members that have come that way. Um, uh, I would say, you know, we used to focus on uh, a few years ago, Craigslist was our best source of, of leads, you know, of when posting jobs and finding candidates, um, you know, we had stroke, you know, tried other hiring sites prior Craigslist started working a lot better, focused on that for a few years, but it, then it died um, for, for us and uh, then switched to Indeed. Indeed was working better. Um, now I use another site that helps post to multiple sites all at once and including Indeed and things like that. And so it all funnels in. Um, and I think, I mean, like I said, it's just the right tools. It, you know, finding these tools that help, you know, it, it pulls it in from a network of sites now and it also is filtering these candidates too, as we're hiring, um, just learning and developing the hiring process. Um, I used to, I would actually, I've been doing this for years with even Craigslist ads. Like I'd put a little thing in there just to say, you know, follow these instructions when you're applying and, you know, you know, eight out of 10 would not follow those instructions. And so you don't, you don't waste time calling them. And now I've got a few more steps in that process. Um, even still. So, um, usually by the time I call someone, um, they just need to show up for the job <laughs> Then we have an interview process and we test them. Um, you know, we send them to the shop and they have a skills test, uh, for the most part. And then, um, and I would say it's 50, 50 that, you know, you we're going to hire them or not. Do you guys train or do you expect experience? Um, a little bit of both. Okay. Um, uh, you know, we've been growing, quite a bit. So it helped. We definitely need people with experience. Um, but we've always trained over the years because we're always with our, with our business. Um, it's always custom. And I would say um, almost every project we're learning something, all of us are learning something on it. Um, and so sometimes, you know, sometimes we're doing something entirely new that we're, we've, we've, we're kind of guessing if it's going to work or not sometimes, you know, engineering something that, client wants. How do you get your, 
is I don't know if rendering is the right term or what what it is. Like, are you using technology? Yes. To, so to like show me what my yep. So one of the things that banister is going to look like or whatever it is, right? Yeah. Like you, I mean, you guys would do slats for stairwells and stuff like that, right? Yep. Okay. So, so we use CAD, uh, you know, computer aided drafting to draw okay. most of our projects. Um, so, so, you know, sometimes we'll get a sketch from a client or just a picture or something. And sometimes they, you know, they're like, you know, we'll show them pictures or, or ideas and, right. and toss them back and forth. And then so usually before we build it, we're, we'll design it in CAD um, so that it's to scale. Yep. Um, and usually we can find any issues at that point that's going to, you know, because there's code requirements. Um, there's engineering issues sometimes that we have to deal with. Right. Um, you know, you know, we just need to make sure things line up with the measurements and just that there's, we're not going to have a conflict once we actually start building it. Um, so we'll, we'll usually do that. And I'll, I, uh, prior to me coming on full time, let's say about 15 years ago, we actually didn't do any CAD work. <laughs> it was all done on paper. Um, and it was all done in sketches, you know, prior to that, you know, it was all hand drawn sketches, um, and drafting, um, but so that was one of the things that initially when I first came in was just bringing technology into the business. <laughs> right. So, which was with, with CAD and, and then just bringing the internet and everything else. To, so. I love it. It's, it's such a fascinating trade because I'm just thinking about all the cool shit I would make. I would just play around in your shop and build shit. Um, yeah. What a, what an amazing, just, profession yeah because it is literally one of the oldest ones out there like yeah. for well, yeah and i will expand too one of the other things that we do is uh, we also do teach blacksmithing classes in blacksmithing and we also teach okay. knife making as well um because that's a very popular thing by a yep. you know, very popular tv show on history channel <laughs> a um, lot of my friends from a lot, a lot of my friends from special operations have gone into that business after getting out of the military forging knives so yeah yeah, not yeah. Surprising to me. so yeah we we teach we teach blacksmithing classes and knife making classes um, you know, we don't find too many employees through that, but there has been some potentials of here and there, like, well, that guy could be an interesting candidate. You know, most of the people that are coming in, they're, uh, come from a completely different industry. You know, some people come from the trades and they're interested in doing it, but we've got a lot of people that are, uh, come from the technology sector, you know, there's, and they, they, they want to do something with their hands and to create something. You know, so when they're creating something from nothing, pretty much, it's like, you know, that there's a lot of satisfaction to that um, compared to just sitting in front of a screen and programming all day or something. So, um, and they get, they say they also get some stress out too, some once in a while, because they can hit something. <laughs> right, right. Do you guys work with different elements besides iron? Um, so in our, in our normal day-to-day -day business, um, we do some stainless and some copper, um, but okay. most of it is going to be out of iron or steel. So. Can I bring my kids to your shop when we're out in Phoenix? Yeah, of course. <laughs> no, we're, we, homes, we're, we're homeschoolers, and all I can think of is like this is the fucking raddest field trip ever. And yeah, like, we we've taught uh, groups of Boy Scouts, and uh, we've had kids as usually around eleven or twelve is about when they're really good like or like when they when they can start really kind of grasping the concepts and things like that and we've got, we've taught we did a, a couple different courses actually just for youth um and i think we started at 11 and it would you know 11 to 17 and we had quite a few and i mean they just they love it so yeah, I, I absolutely can imagine they love yeah. getting the blisters from you know <laughs> and and burns and scars <laughs> that's amazing man yeah, count us in. We'll, we'll we'll come by for sure. I guarantee you. Yeah. Um, tell me this. Then the next thing I want to dive into is okay, family business. Um, what what challenges? You don't have to share any dirty oh. laundry, but like, what what challenges have you guys run into in a family business? Because I know that brings a lot of different dynamics to the the forefront. Oh yeah. No. So I you know I I work with my dad, and. Uh, 
you know, it, we had, we had some rough times, you know, I would say, um, and you know, we butt heads and we'll still do it once in a while. We did it this morning a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, for the most part, I, we found our groove like of where we go. Um, and, uh, um, uh, you know, initially, I guess we, we, uh, we would just clash a lot. And, and a lot of it came down to, we were communicating in a different way, but about like, we also, we also, we had the same objective, you know, the same, the same, uh, the same, we, we, we knew we were wanting the same thing. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, so hold on, let me ask some questions to put some context behind things. So 15 years ago, you came into the business, your dad had run the business. How many people roughly worked with him at that point in time? So and did he like run the everyday day-to-day -day operation? Plus he was like the man forging the steel at that exactly. point. Exactly. Yeah. At that point he was running day-to-day -day operations um, and doing, you know, all the admin things and, um, and doing, he would, he would focus on doing the, the, the more intricate forged parts at that time. Um, and we had somewhere between maybe four and six employees at the time. Okay. Um, and I mean, I think right after I, I we, we, we kind of went to about 10. I remember that like right after I came on and, and, uh, and that, you know, and we were growing a little bit at that point. And so I, that's where I kind of started. I really helped working with the clients um, taking off some of that, uh, you know, the communication, writing up estimates and, and, and then working into the design um, aspect. So trying to, you know, take those things off, um, you know, and we've had our ups and downs with employees since then we've been down to at one point, five, six years ago, it was just the him and I, and one other employee at one point, okay. um, you know, with, you know, the ebbs and flows of things. And, yep. um, but now we're about, about, there's about 20 of us and, you know, total in our company. Um, and, uh, we've kind of settled into the visionary integrator where I'm more of the visionary. He's more the integrator. He's, you know, um, if I can set things in front of him, he gets it done, <laughs> you know, um, you know, and, uh, I still deal with the clients, uh, for the most part, I'm working on uh, replacing myself at the moment, <laughs> you know, or, you know, uh, that's my objective in the next year to two years is to, you know, find my replacements. I, I, it's, it's hard to do in one person. Um, but because of all the hats I still wear <laughs> and being a custom shop. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And I know that like my cousins ran a manufacturing, um, shop that their dad started and they were all involved in it. And it, it, I just watched the family business from afar and it, it just brings in a interesting dynamic that I think you really need to get organized and have your operations kind of buttoned up and everybody's got to be really settled in, in their roles and responsibilities. Cause if they stay in their space, and yeah. everybody respects everybody's role, then, then it, it, it works. Um, it's, it, it definitely does not come without its challenges. I'm sure I've never been in that position, but it's, it's definitely interesting. It, I've worked with my wife, so <laughs> yeah so challenges as well so similar. yeah i i keep trying to convince my wife to uh <laughs> to come on because like, i i think i can work with her she doesn't think i can work with, she doesn't think i can work with her <laughs> it's that, that aspect um but yeah it's a um i mean she you know she she works in another her family business you know with with her parents on her side too so it comes down to we we, we both see you know from family businesses on both sides um, wow. And, you know, there's challenges in all different aspects and, um, but yeah, for the most part, my dad and I have, you know, really found our, our groove together and found how we like to communicate. I mean, one of the things is I was, um, whether I really knew it or intentional about it was that I was very honest with him up front, like, or like when, when it was, especially when we first started working, like of like, 
would he'd ask for critique on something, you know, whether he was working on a design or working on like, you know, I, I had talked to a client and like, okay, we want to make this part and I'd go to him and he'd make it. And I'd be like, well, no, it needs to get, you know, we need to check, you know, change this and this. I don't think that's acceptable. You know, like, and so I was like, you know, I'd be honest, you know, and what I thought, you know, I wasn't going to hold back because I was thinking like, I know what the finished part is. And we have some clients with some really high expectations. And, uh, and I know it, like there was a period where it was rough on him. Um, yeah. but also it's come to the understanding that I am, I'm not going to hold back. Like, so when it is time, like to be on, you know, like he still trusts my opinion. So, right. Well, it's important to have everybody, as long as they understand that there's the best interest of the actual company is what's yeah. important, right? Yeah. Like that's what's so hard when you get like husband and wives or that type of relationship working together because it, it's very difficult to strip back that like emotional tone of voice, whatever the baggage that comes with it. Like, yeah. hey, we were arguing about the kids this morning. Now we're having this stern conversation at the 10 a.m. team meeting. And yeah, it's like and, and, and it's tough to decipher like what's what in those situations. And then I'm sure with a father son relationship, especially like my brain immediately went to the fact that he had already been doing this for years without you. And yeah. so like and he's your dad, so he fucking knows best. That's for sure. And like, it, yeah. there, there's a learning curve there for sure. Because I, I mean, I go all the way back to when we first opened our gym. Like, I ran our gym just like that. That I knew what was going on. My wife didn't know what was going on. I knew it. I had to execute on it anyway. So, like, get out of my way. I don't need a bunch of feedback and opinions. Cause I've got to do it anyway. I'm the one working 16 hours, not mm -hmm. you. So like, I'll do it my way. <laughs> yeah. So I'm yeah. sure, I'm sure that dynamic was like, it, that was humbling, interesting, and probably galvanizing for your relationship for sure. Yeah. I mean, and for, the fact and that for the still there 50 years later is proof. Yeah. And for the most part, it, you know, I, I relied you know, a lot on his experience, you know, and that I, you know, and that's, you know, I, I still constantly will ask for advice, you know, and that's, that's the thing. And so, and we, so we, we try to, you know, when we run into problems that we haven't had before, you know, challenges, it's like, we'll, we'll brainstorm together. And now actually we, I actually, it's even more so with the rest of our team. So, and there's a lot of times I'll, I'll go to our guys in the shop or guys in the field who are doing it and say, well, you know, is rely on them for their opinion on, you know, we need how to do this right. That's, that's really awesome though, to hear is because like you went in with a humble mindset and, and he was receptive to, to you and, and your honesty. And I think that's important, but you probably mm -hmm. earned his respect with that honesty. Cause like, if you were just gonna, like, he probably would have ran you over if you just gave like, fake answers because he's like fucking i'm not gonna ask anymore because he's mm -hmm. not telling me this shit i'm getting complaints from the customers like so <laughs> yeah you know exactly. what i mean like, exactly <laughs> so it actually worked out your level of transparency is like showed that you were had his best interest in mind too for sure so that's super important definitely yeah that yeah, I've, uh, I, I realized that actually a little bit more recently, I was writing a, con a contribution for another book and, and that, that realizing that transparency, how, how much it had effect on our relationship, you know, so, so it was, it was only recently that I kind of really took that into account. <laughs> it's super unique that you and your wife work for family businesses, though. That's, that, that's an interesting dynamic as well. Yeah. So. And the thing is, is she's, you know, she's a little bit kind of the opposite. She's more of an integrator role than me. And so I know that's why, like, I think that we'd actually work well together, you yep. know, is that because, although I think that's also why we won't work well together. It's, 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 it's both, right. <laughs> you know, I know we would have a learning curve for, for us to, to, for us to really work together and mesh, but. 
Absolutely. So where do you see this going with regards to your business in the, the next few years, three to five years or whatever? I mean, is your dad planning on staying? Like, is he going to be involved forever? You and- know, he's he's one that's uh, always always been in the mindset that he's always going to be involved forever, you yep. know. Um, but it, as we've grown and had more like opportunity to kind of, in a, in a sense, step back a little bit from the active, like day-to-day operations. Um, he's, he's find, he's found his like passion for hiking and backpacking, uh, mm-hmm. more so recently. So he's, you know, he's been planning longer trips and to be able to, you know, take some time away. Um, so he had planned it last year, uh, didn't get a chance to, um, uh, because of the fires, but this year he's going to Tahoe to hike around the Tahoe Lake, you know, the full rim. Um, and, uh, so that's be a couple of weeks. He'll be gone. And, uh, and, uh, but so, and I mean, and so I think in, you know, in the next few years, he's going to be going on even longer, you yeah. know, backpacks. And so, and, you know, and, and that's working and building our team up to also replace him as well as the operations, um, you know, on the operations side. So, right. Um, so I think there's that, um, we've been, uh, slowly taking on some new projects for us, which is, uh, um, doing structural metalwork, you know, doing structural steel for, for the homes we work on. Um, so it's still, we're, you know, we mostly do all high-end residential, you know, homes that are two, $4 million and up, you know, and, uh, and, over the years, contractors keep on saying, like, we're trying to find the steel, like I, the structural steel people that'll be reliable and things like that. And they just, and uh, um, so we've been slowly taking more on and it's looking like that's that's going to be a bigger uh, avenue for our business, which will help us grow um, because that's a much more sizable scale. Scale, yeah, um, yeah, for sure. So, um, so we're looking at that and um, but also at the same time, we know we still have all the other ornamental and architectural work. And, uh, like I said, just, uh, it's still growing and, and the way, and the way, I mean, even with the, the way the economy has recently that, you know, we, we, you know, we, we experienced it even in 2008, you know, when the recession happened, I, most of our work, our, our high-end clients, they most, their projects didn't slow down much. I mean, there might've been a hiccup for a couple months, you know, people taking a breath and wondering what's going to happen. But, uh, a lot of these projects are two, three, four years in the making, you know, even before we're starting on them. So, um, they're not going to stop, <laughs> you know, so, I, you know, I think we got to, you know, uh, we, we've got a window of time at least before something really. Do you guys service mainly the Phoenix area or are you all over the place? So mainly Phoenix, uh, in the surrounding towns. So, um, there's a couple of the higher end towns, like people have heard of Scottsdale and, uh, Paradise Valley sometimes, but they're, um, some of the wealthier neighborhoods. Um, but we do once in a while ship railings and, and some gates. Um, we've shipped them as far as Hawaii and Florida and Virginia, Washington. Um, people find us online and they want, our product and they, you know, we've got a couple, uh, I designed a pool railing that was very like sculptural, um, that is very popular at times. I get two or three calls a week from people around the country asking about it. So (laughs) in fact, I got one in Dallas that a lady, I just talked to yesterday. She's, she was saying she really wanted one just like it. So (laughs) it's awesome, man. That's really cool. What do you enjoy outside of work? Um, spending time with my family right now. My kids are, uh, five and three. Yep. And so that, you know, spending much time as I can with them, you know, usually the weekends are trying to set aside for them and, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, and, and I, I think about it the last few years, I've probably been on 75 hard more than I've been more on it than I've been off of it. I've, you know, completed, <laughs> completed it three or four times. I'm, I'm trying to actually finish live hard this year. I will, no, I'm not, I'm not trying. I am going to finish live hard this year. There you go. <laughs> I'm on phase right. two. Good, good. So, so that also consumes some time outside of work at, you know, when doing 75 hard, you know, getting the extra workouts and things like that. So. 
Yeah. yeah. We've got phase three, July 5th. Yeah. Starts. Seems like we've been on a break forever since phase two. So yeah, I'll be absolutely. starting right up, right up after that, right for phase three as well. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're, you're mid July. Is that right? Yeah. I think, yeah, I think it's mid July. I got to nail down the date, but I think it's July 11th. And I think I got to start. Gotcha. Gotcha, man. Um, what, what, what kind of lessons learned or like piece of advice would you have for our, our listeners? If you had one thing that you would impart on them could be anything. That's what's so great about this. Oh man. Yeah. We've gone kind of all, all different places. Uh-huh. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, that's really helped us with our business is, uh, financially wise, is um, several years ago, I read the book Profit First. Um, you've probably heard that, but heard of that book, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have. Um, but, um, and it's taken, you know, it took a while to even truly integrate it. But, uh, but that's, that's been a huge change in, in managing cash flow, managing our money. Um, Cause if anything, it's like people don't understand it's, you know, you kind of have different buckets of, uh, or in, in your different accounts that you put your money towards of, you know, and you, you have a profit account and your, uh, your expenses and your, your, uh, we have one for our payroll, actually our net payroll. And we have one for our, actually our taxes. Excellent. Um, and I mean, and I think we have a couple others, but that, that the money instantly, as it comes in, it gets divided into those accounts. Um, and, uh, it's helped by managing it because I mean, you know, years ago, like, you know, you'd be at $10,000 in the bank and you think you'd, you're doing all right. And then payroll hits and, you know, and that was when you only had a few guys, you know, so like, you know, or something comes up and, and it, you know, it wipes that account out and now you're scrambling to get to make payroll or something. And, uh, um, but with that, with the accounts is you can see, usually a lot sooner, how fast, like, you know, that like, Hey, like, you know, our, our payroll accounts getting low and we got payroll coming up next week. I mean, we got other money in the other accounts, but for some reason our payroll accounts low, it's like, but by knowing that, Hey, I need to get so much money in there to fill the percentage. Like, you know, there's a certain percentage that you're dividing it. Like, so I need not just how much I need for payroll. I need, you know, you know, for us, it's about 30% is our uh, net payroll for our guys. And, and, uh, so, so like, if I know it's low, but well, I need to get the money, you know, three times that roughly and a little bit more in the bank before payroll actually hits. Well, that helps fill those other accounts. And at that time too, I mean, we're using that money too. So like, you know, it, 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 it seemed like it, it, again, it just, it works. It's, it's just a little better dashboard in a way to like really see things sooner. Yep. Um, I, I agree. Mike so, McCallowitz. Profit yeah. first. That's I, we, it's, I go ahead. Oh, I just I would say it's one of the best books. I think any I mean any business owner, and I think you can you can adapt it to just about any business. So yep. And I because I think it, that it's referred to as top line accounting. Top line accounting is when you operate out of like one income account. And that's mm-hmm. what you're talking about. Like, oh, you've got a big influx of cash, and so you're like, oh, let's buy new shit. Or whatever, like oh, no big deal. We um, we can add X, Y, and Z from an equipment standpoint because we've got all this cash. And then you're like, oh, well, payroll and oh, taxes. And it, it really does just change the way that you do things once you set up those buckets. And the best thing I thought, I think that we implemented that at the gym in 2016, I think, and that it it did it completely transformed our business. Um, yeah. And, and the the most refreshing aspect of that was the tax account, in my opinion. I, we I was going to say huge, massive t- tax account at the end of the year, and we would pay our taxes and we would still have money left over. And so it was kind of like a windfall at the end of the year, every year. And you didn't have to cut a check personally. Yeah. Because you're saving it through the business. Well, so our challenge was, uh, you know, with having a lot of employees was payroll taxes. Mm-hmm. Um, and really until, and I, you know, I, I had done it 
with, uh, for a while I had just had a payroll account, but I wasn't, you know, like, but you know, I look at the net payroll and well, I'd only pay that, but then like payroll taxes were all this extra on top of it. Well, so I finally, I rolled our, our tax account. I've actually figured it to where if pay, if has our taxes for the, you know, the year, like he mentions, but also I, I actually put our payroll taxes, that amount into that. And by having that move, you know, that amount in there, I mean, we've, you know, been able to pay payroll taxes when they need to be paid. So, <laughs> so it just pulls out quarterly and you take care of that 13% or whatever it is, 11% or. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, we, we, we do. Uh, I mean, well, as we pay bi-weekly, we owe every other week for, for us, but, yeah. but yeah, so after, after our pay week, you know, we will, we'll pay our payroll taxes out of that account. And it just, that's uh, helped us budget for that because it's a, it's a huge chunk that, uh, I mean, we we found ourselves in a in a problem with you know right. getting behind on payroll taxes, and you find that's that's uh that's one of the one tax the that you can't negotiate down. You can never yep. get, <laughs> and so it, one, yeah, don't mess around with that. Well, good, good. When did you guys implement that? How long ago? Um, I think it was about 2018. I think when we we started implementing uh profit first. I think it was actually about two years ago that I implemented the, the, the tax, like moving our payroll taxes really into that, which, so it helped. And again, it's just tweaking over time. You yeah, know, learning I was going to say, it took me probably 18 months to get mine fixed to where it was like systemized and automated exactly the way it was working efficiently. Yeah. Um, I had to read the book two or three times and then kind of just reapply what we were doing. But it was it was a matter of just putting it into print practice and then kind of tweaking and making it perfect for you. So, yeah, that's a, exactly. That's a great tip, man. Profit first for those of you out there. Yeah, we started like I think how he mentions we I I went back on what we did spend, you know, and compared the amounts. Um, but then you know also setting aside that amount for our profit, you know, taking a little bit. I think we started with like two percent, you know, and then you know bumped it up over the years, you know, so that you know it, it's not as much of a huge change. Um, but you initially do start pulling that little percentage out of like your expenses, and you know, like you said, you just you you see money in the bank, and you it's uh, human nature to just think you can spend it. And uh, yeah, yeah. markets is law; it fills the. It fills the space allotted for it. For so sure. You will spend every penny if you leave it in there. <laughs> or it will go sure. somewhere. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So. Yeah. All right, man. Well, Jason, did you have anything else to add? No, no. I don't have anything else to add, I don't think. So it's been good chatting with you. appreciate your story. I, I appreciate you talking to me. I appreciate your time. Um, your, your business is fascinating. So it was, it was really fun for me to hear about and imagine what you do on a regular basis. And like I said, I'm going to make a trip out and see you guys and see what you do in that person. Good. I'm going yeah. to bang some knives out. There you go. For sure. So um, thanks, man. I appreciate it. I'll see you in a couple weeks and uh, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the show. Make sure you subscribe, leave a review, and share with a friend. We'll, we'll, we'll see you we'll see on the next episode, next episode of the Tactical Empire.